Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and I want to kind of go back to the transit method of detecting exoplanets and show you how you can derive an equation or expression to calculate the transit duration time. So this is how long it takes for the planet to pass in front of the star. And it's going to be dependent on things like the size of the planet, size of the star and the orbital period. So how far away the, the planet is actually from the star and we can basically derive an expression or an equation to work out how long it takes to pass in front of the star. So if you've seen some of my other videos you'll understand the transit method but basically as a planet passes in front of the star we get a dip in the brightness. So we typically get this u-shaped dip so on this plot here We've got the brightness of the star, which is denoted as the normalized flux. And then the phase along the bottom is essentially just the time. So that's how long it takes to go across the star. A faster planet, you're going to get a more narrow U-shape dip. If it's a slower planet, so if it's further out on its orbit, it's going to be much wider. And again, if we know things like the size of the planet, the size of the star, its orbit, stuff like that, we can calculate how long it's going to take for it to transit across or the duration or if we don't know these other, these other properties we can calculate them from the time it takes to go across. So the time it takes to actually transit across the star is dependent again as I mentioned before on the size of the star, the planet and its orbit but also the impact parameter. Now again I've done extra videos kind of on the impact parameter and the orbit and all those sorts of things but just a recap on the impact parameter just so you're aware of what that might be. Now there's something known as limb darkening on a star. What that basically means is if we take the disk of the star and the planet passes in front of it but depending on where it passes that star it will block out more or less light and that's because the cent central part of that star is actually brighter than it is towards the limb or towards the edge part. So if it goes across the centre, it actually blocks out more light as a percentage of the overall star brightness. So here, if the star goes across, or the planet, I should say, goes across the star in the centre, it's going to block out the maximum amount of light that it can do. If it goes across more towards the outer edge, it just kind of skims across the edge, then it's actually going to block out the least amount of light. So it affects the depth and to some degree, actually, the, the shape of the transit. If it's going towards the limb and towards the edge, that transit becomes a little bit more V-shaped as opposed to U-shaped because the transit duration is less. It should make sense, actually, why it's less. If it goes across the small top bit there, like this one is, it's going to take less time because, actually, the distance across the star is less. If it goes across the centre, we get a longer transit duration. So this impact parameter is important for that. So it has a value basically between zero and one, depending on where it transits. And it's essentially normalized to the radius of the star itself. So if it's towards the outer edge, it's going to be one. So the impact parameter B is going to be one if it's right on the edge. And if it's towards the center part, then it will be essentially zero. Now we can start to look at the geometry of this setup to get some equations so we can then derive the transit duration. So we've also got this kind of inclination angle which is the inclination of the orbit of the planet with regards to our line of sight. So we call this I, that's our inclination angle. If it's kind of has some inclination and it's going across the top then obviously we have the value there um, which is very straightforward. We've then got this red line, this red distance, which is the semi-major axis, A, of the planet. So that's the orbital radius, essentially. Um, and then we've got the radius of the star. The radius of the star is denoted as the R with the kind of star symbol, basically, which is fairly typical when we're talking about stars, whether it be radius, mass, things like that. And anyway, depending on where this planet crosses across, so you see the blue line, the blue horizontal line there, that will be the impact parameter times the stellar radius. So if it's zero, that obviously means that that distance is going to be zero. If it's one, it's going to be the stellar radius. And we can then write the impact parameter as we've got in the upper part of the screen there. So B can then be equal to the 
semi meter axis times cos of the inclination angle divided by the radius of the star. So now I've got an expression or an equation for the impact parameter. So again, going back to the geometry of this setup then, we want to actually calculate the total distance that the planet passes across the star. And that's going to relate to things like the radius of the star and the radius of the planet. So here, we've again got the radius of the star. We've then also got the radius of the planet, denoted as the RP, down in the bottom right. Now, the distance travelled, or half the distance travelled, by the planet is given as L. So the total distance is going to be 2L. And again, we can use geometry to actually calculate this. So if we then calculate that um, vertical distance there, we can basically write that as B times the radius of the star is equal to the centimeter axis cos I. So now we've actually got an expression where we can start to actually look at well, writing an equation for the total distance travelled from the geometry of that. And again, using geometry, you can write it like this here, because we know from the previous kind of uh, screen what we actually had. So it's going to be 2L, because that's the total distance that's gone across the star. And it's essentially just going to be equal to this here, because we had the L there, we had the other parts of the triangle essentially so this is what we've got here this is our total distance traveled now if we then want to look at this as an angle swept out so the angle that is swept out of the actual orbit itself as it passes across the star so i've kind of highlighted that here with like the yellow rectangular box there we've got the angle that is going to be swept out that angle swept out is obviously related to the total distance traveled so as it goes around, there's going to be a percentage of that orbit which is swept out across the star that we actually are measuring. So that angle swept out is going to be dependent on the semi-major axis of its orbit. Essentially, if it's closer to the star, it's going to be different than it will be as it's further out. So now we've got the semi-major axis, we've got an angle, we've got the total distance travelled across the star. Now... One of the key assumptions when we derive this is that it's, the orbit's going to be circular. When it becomes elliptical, it's not quite so straightforward. So the, the key thing we're kind of denoting here is that it's circular. If it's elliptical, then the transit, the U-shaped transit we get can actually be asymmetric because the velocity of the planet across the star changes. So it could come in faster and then slow down. So assuming it's circular, then the circumference, the circumference of the orbit is given as 2 pi a, where a is the semi-major axis, and the semi-major axis would be the distance between the two objects, and that doesn't change because it's going to be circular. So we've got the circumference of an orbit now. So what we want to do then is write the distance travelled in terms of the angle. So we've got 2L there, but we can actually calculate not calculate, but we can write that in terms of the angle. So the distance L, which is half of the distance travelled across the star, divided by the semi-major axis is equal to sine theta divided by 2. So we can write that basically in terms of the angle instead. So we can now look at the actual time taken to cross the star. So the time duration now is what we're going to work towards actually deriving. So this is going to relate to the orbital period P and then the angle swept out. And we can write it as P times theta over 2 pi, basically. So we've got the angle swept out and we've got the orbital period. We likely would have already calculated the orbital period. We would probably know that from something else. And then the angle swept out, we can actually rewrite that in terms of the distance traveled across the star, which again can be written in terms of the size of the star, planet, that sort of thing as well, an impact parameter. So what we're gonna do now is we had a previous expression for the distance traveled in terms of the angle. If we rewrite that in terms of theta, the angle, and then put that in, so substitute that in, we can then actually remove the angle at, and then the transit duration is then written in terms of the period, the distance traveled, and the semi-major axis instead.
So we now can actually go back and put in a, well, the equation for the distance traveled. So the distance traveled L can now go back into this equation here and we can remove L out. And what this will do is then put the transit duration in terms of the orbital parameters and also the physical properties of the planet and star. So essentially the radius. So what we should then get is we get something that looks like this. So we now have an equation for the transit duration. We know where it came from because we looked at the geometry of that. And what we have here is we've got the orbital period in there. We've got the radius of the star, the radius of the planet, the semi-major axis, and also the impact parameter. Some of those we would likely know from other kind of uh, observations. So normally when you're doing detection of exoplanets, you might already have the radius of the star because that would have been calculated using a different method. We would get the orbital period by looking at the time between different transits. That would give us our orbital period. At the week, from the orbital period, we could probably get this seven major axis. So quite a few of those we might already know. And then we can calculate maybe the radius of the planet or something else from the transit duration. It all depends kind of what we got really. But anyway, this is now our equation for the transit duration and we know where it came from due to the geometry of that. Now, thank you for watching. And if you find the videos helpful or you enjoy the videos, then do consider becoming a member. You get extra benefits. So I basically put videos in the member section and also it just generally helps support the channel as well. So thank you.